Uh, welcome to our next talk, Practical Sphinx, with Carol Willing, and I will let you take it away. Thank you, everyone, and um, welcome to PyCon 2018 and lovely Cleveland. We are almost halfway through the talk sessions, which is really hard to believe, but um, I hope everybody is enjoying themselves and will continue to enjoy themselves. So today we're going to talk about practical sphinx. And when I say practical sphinx, I mean the sphinx that you're a developer, documentation is only part of your job, and you need to kind of get the most done in the least amount of time. And I highly encourage you, if you can find a full-time documentation person who's trained in doing documentation, to do that because they add so much to a project. But unfortunately, in open source, we don't always have the funding to do that. So today, we're going to take a little dive through what we can do when we don't have somebody dedicated to documentation. So we're going to start with a few challenges. And it should come as no surprise that one of the biggest challenges is people. People have opinions. Some people like Markdown. Some people like restructured text. Some people write their documentation in Jupyter Notebooks. So how do you get everybody on the same page moving forward, take into account accessibility needs and of your documentation, um, present it to a global audience? There's a lot of things and moving parts you have to think of. Another challenge is, let's say you've got an existing project, there's a lot of documentation already, but the documentation is not really doing what you think it should be doing. Do you go in with a scalpel and just do a small section at a time? Or do you take a sledgehammer and say, I'm going to start from scratch and just get rid of everything that was done before? Do you use Sphinx? Or do you use some of the other newer JavaScript tools that are out there to do documentation? Because they seem really simple. Question, who knows? Um, processes. You want your docs to stay up to date. How do you figure out what a good workflow is? And how do you manage all the details that go along with documentation? Another challenge is just flat out time. How are you going to be efficient and get your documentation done as well as getting your doc development work done? Uh, back in 2015, when I started working on Project Jupiter, I said, oh, I'll pitch in on documentation. We had over 40 repos. And the projects were in different formats. Some of them built, some of them didn't. And it was in a really different state. And meanwhile, I was also working on development on Jupyter Hub. So I quickly started realizing that this was going to be my life unless I got practical. And I knew I needed a plan of attack. So I decided that it was best to get practical and in doing so, come up with what was going to work for my team, as well as what was going to work for me, and most importantly, what was going to work for the users of my documentation. And why did I even care about documentation? Well, I firmly believe that documentation is a vital part of any software development project for a few reasons. First and foremost, you want people to use your project. And if you have great documentation, or even good documentation, you are much more likely to have people using your project. You also usually want more contributors. If you make your documentation good, then people will use it. People will feel comfortable with your project and start contributing and know how to contribute. And most of all, you want your users to be able to install your project. For each snag they run into as they go through your installation instructions, that's an opportunity for them to opt out of using your project. So even if you're not excellent with words, don't worry. We're going to go through some steps that are going to kind of take you on a roadmap of what you can do that's practical. All right, 
So let's start with the basics. Um, I realize there's probably a variety of different experience levels with Sphinx in here. Some people are probably much more experienced in documentation than I am. Others, this may be your first step towards documentation. So the first part in our practical plan is let's look at the basics. So with Sphinx, you've got to install it, and that you just use pip to install it just as you would any other Python package. To create a Sphinx project, what's really nice is you can create a directory on your system, and then Sphinx comes with a quick start mode, which will walk you through a series of questions, and you will answer the questions, and for the most part, other than the name of your project and your name, you can use the defaults to get started. So you don't have to agonize, should I choose yes, should I choose no, just choose the defaults, that'll get you started, and anything else you can adjust over time. Um, what that quick start will do is it will build a scaffolding of documentation for you. And in that scaffolding of documentation, you will have three really important files. One is conf.py, which contains all the configuration and settings information for your documentation. Index.rest is a restructured text file that has your table of contents. It typically has a short paragraph of what your project does. And the make file is what you can use to build your docs, to do spell check, to check all the links that are in your docs. I find the make files much easier to use than the Sphinx build command. There are special commands that you can have, but they're a little bit longer. Okay, so let's look a little bit at conf.py because that's where you will spend a lot of time adjusting settings as you get more and more familiar with um, Sphinx. And one of the cool things about conf.py is because it's got that PY ending, it's just like any other Python file. You can not only adjust settings, but you can also execute code. So if there's particular things that you want to do, maybe you've got some C libraries in there and you want to do something funky with them in order to document them, you can run that code when you build Sphinx stocks. So it's pretty cool. So remember that over time. You can execute code. Um, to build your docs, I typically run make clean, which kind of gives you a clean slate. It gets rid of anything that was built before and then I run make build, and that will build HTML docs. And then the natural next step is to serve the docs locally on your computer, and starting up a Python web server in Python 3. And if you're doing docs, um, I highly, highly encourage you to use Python 3. Um, it doesn't even matter if the underlying project is in Python 2. It is best to use Python 3 for documentation and use a recent version of Sphinx. And then you just navigate to that URL at the bottom. OK, so now you've got the basics down. We're doing pretty well. Content is one of the key foundations of documentation. And words tend to be something that we use quite a bit in documentation. So I talked about before those opinionated developers where some people like restructured text, some people like markdown. Some people like notebooks, you know, it's sort of like ice cream. Some people like vanilla, some people like strawberry, some people like chocolate. You could force your whole team to use one, but I have found that actually I would rather have my developers writing documentation in what they're comfortable in than not writing documentation. So let's walk through real quickly how you can use all three of them together. Restructured text, this is the, the straightforward one. You do nothing other than write the restructured text. You don't have to adjust your configuration or anything else. If you're using Markdown, which a lot of people like because that's what's rendered in GitHub natively, and um, it tends to be uh, more visually simple, I think, for people getting started, um, what you do is you import this library called Recommon Mark. And in particular, it has a parser that will parse your markdown source file. And then the final thing that you add in your configuration file is the source suffix contains a list of the types of source files that you can 
parse. And so you add MD. Oops, sorry. All right. Now, say you want to use Jupyter Notebooks, and Jupyter Notebooks are near and dear to my heart. And when I started in 2015, started working with the Jupyter documentation, it was not easy to get notebooks into documentation. And fortunately now, somebody has developed an extension called NB Sphinx. And we'll talk a little bit more about extensions in a little bit. But NB Sphinx, basically what you do is once you've pip installed it, you will then add it to your list of extensions. And then just as before we did with Markdown, you will add the IPYNB files to your list of source suffixes. And to actually use all these types together, you go and you create your index.rest, which I said typically contains your table of contents. And in that table of contents, you can have restructured text files, markdown files, notebook files. They can be randomly mixed together, interspersed. They could all be rest and one markdown. So it's really quite nice. But, and Sphinx is smart enough when it builds it to build it so that it all renders as HTML. Um, so say you have only one member of your team that likes writing in Markdown, but all, everybody else likes restructured text, you can use a tool called Pandoc, which is sort of your Swiss Army knife for switching Markdown to restructured text, LaTeX to restructured text. And, you know, it's a, it's a command line program, but also it has a really nifty online um, uh, converter at pandoc.try and the try, if you've only first started using it, it's kind of cool to see how well it does. Now, the one thing with pandoc is it's not perfect. It will get you probably 80 to 90% of the way there, but you're still going to want to look at those source files after converting them and maybe make some final tweaks. Um, as far as drafts go, uh, I don't expect perfection when I'm being practical. So I encourage you just to write what you need, whether it's bullets or phrases. Get the content down first. Worry about the quality later, because you can go back, or other people can go back and edit it. You can reread your documentation. Reading it out loud is a good way of editing it. If English is not your first language and you don't feel real comfortable with grammar, you can use a tool like Grammarly that will suggest changes in grammar to you. And um, Sphinx comes with an extension that does uh, spell checking. And this particular resource at the bottom is great. So if it's your first time writing, this really covers all the bases for style of um, open source documentation. And the spelling extension, is pretty much like the other extensions that we've seen so far. You're going to import it, you're going to append it to the list of extensions you have, and you can provide it a word list that has, like Jupyter is spelled kind of weird. It's got J-U-P-Y-T-E-R. So we can add that to the word list, and it won't kind of mark it as a spelling error each time, which is kind of nice. And you just type make spelling, and um, it will go through and tell you. Um, another key part of content is visuals, and the visuals, um, you can add images into your um, documentation. And when I first started doing documentation, I had no idea how to do that. And a lot of it was sort of reading the docs, kind of trying it, getting it wrong, reading some more docs, looking at examples of other documentation. But basically what you're doing is you have these things called directives. And it's basically two periods, a space, the directive name, two colons, and then some optional information after it. So in this case, we've got an image file name, and most uh, images are stored in the static directory. And so you'll have this text in a restructured text file, and then when it renders after running make build, you'll get this really nice documentation with an image embedded in there. Another directive that is very useful, there's a set of things like warnings, tips, see also, important. Um, again, two periods, the name, 
two colons, and then you basically skip a space, and then you can write whatever content on it. So in this case, you'd get a warning block like that. And it's pretty straightforward. And um, another thing you might want to do with directives is to add code to your documentation. And that code um, would just be dot dot code. And when it renders, you get a nice rendering of your code. And one of the things that you can do is after the colons, you can add the words like Python or Bash or Ruby or whatever, and it will give you syntax highlighting, which is really nice. So moving along, structure is probably the second most important thing. Um, and it's especially important when you're working with multiple repos. And your table of contents, your talk tree, as it's called in Sphinx, is what adds structure to your documents. The talk tree is, has some things like maximum depth or captions that lets you customize how the talk tree looks. So in this case, we said maximum depth two. When we render docs that have a depth, in this case, two will give us two levels of headers. So we have installation, and then we have the subheaders from that page as well. Um, captions can also be used with uh, your table of contents to actually give you a sidebar um, structure as well as structure within your table of contents. And in this case, what you can do is break things up like a customization guide, an installation guide, and um, it's, in this case, you would have several small talk trees in your index file. Uh, workflow is also really important, and it's really important for you, the developer, because it saves you time. You can use testing, just like you do with code testing. You can use make build, make link check, we'll check for valid links, make spelling we talked about. You can automate that with a Travis CI file. You can also use GitHub webhooks to, you know, send stuff to Travis every time you've uh, pushed code and also um, read the docs. And read the docs is wonderful. Um, they have been a great supporter of um, documentation in the Python community for a long, long time. Um, most folks are used to using a GUI for um, setting up their documentation. But if you're setting up multiple repos, you might consider using a YAML file to actually set the settings for the um, read the docs. And it, you basically specify requirements.txt and the version of Python you want to use. And that goes in the root of your repo. Now, I said at the beginning, Jupyter had like 44 repos when I started, and monitoring the build of all of those projects was a challenge. I had the choice of either pulling each one up individually, which got old really quickly, or first I actually built just a markdown file that took badges for every document uh, repo, and then what I did is I made like a simple static thing that would update regularly. So instead of having to pull one, uh, everyone up every morning, I was able to simply look at the dashboard, look for any red, oops, it's not building, and then go address those. Um, so in terms of summarizing a workflow, you're going to work through your content. You're going to use those tools and automation to deliver your documentation. And then feedback is a really, really important thing. So where do you get feedback on your documentation? Well, rarely will you get, hey, these docs are awesome. You might get, oh, these docs stink. But really, the best place to get feedback is either in your issues or your mailing list. Because people, when they ask questions, that will be the things that indicate your documentation needs tweaking. And um, so for a long time, I just monitored our mailing lists. And as I saw good questions, I went and just made small changes to the documentation. And that's just basically you're iterating through this cycle again and again. Uh, extensions we talked about a little bit. And that basically lets you add functionality. So this is sort of the highest point of the pyramid and something that you probably wouldn't do until you'd been working with Sphinx for probably a few weeks to a month. Um, one of the really nice extensions is Autodoc. And that lets you um, 
document, use your doc strings that are in your code to actually document your project. And on the right-hand side, we have a users.rest file that uses a series of directives to um, basically pull in module information, to pull in class information, attributes, and you can also intersperse um, prose in it as well. And when it renders, it looks something like this. So basically, you've typed make build, it goes and it looks through all your source code that you have a, an autodoc file and a rest file for, and then builds a really nice little interface like that. And that can be really useful um, if you have a lot of configurability in your project. Um, now, code bases that have been around for a while might have doc strings in different formats. Some people like to use a Google format for doc strings. Some people like to use NumPy style doc strings. If you use um, the extension Napoleon and all you really have to do is add it, uh, as we see here in the second line of the extensions list, it will convert either one. And um, that saves you some time in when you go back and look at stuff. Um, some folks um, will write third-party extensions at Jupyter. We have special ex extensions to auto-document these things called traits, which are basically configuration settings for individual elements. And to do that, we have in a Sphinx extension directory an auto-doc-traits.py file. And then we basically append that directory to the path that Sphinx looks in and then call it out as an extension. But it really is just a Python file. All right, so we've went through the practical part of Sphinx, and I wanted to spend a few seconds talking about how do you make your docs look good? And um, especially now that JavaScript is being used more and more in our projects, how do we handle JavaScript? Should we be using JavaScript instead of Sphinx? So looking at Sphinx, Sphinx has some great support for navigation, which is probably the single biggest reason to use Sphinx. Um, it lets you navigate both within documents and across documents and also across projects. So it's really, um, from a professional documentation standpoint, um, probably the gold standard as far as that goes. Um, it has a really nice integration with Read the Docs. Um, really helpful communities around Sphinx and Write the Docs that will answer questions as you get on your documentation journey. And the Sphinx team itself is super responsive and very active and they're doing great work. So um, if you're not on 1.7, download 1.7 and move to 1.7 because there's some nice little features that um, will be useful. Um, looking at JavaScript, one of the reasons to use a JavaScript tool is you've got some beautiful themes. You can um, uh, have some different tools that are a little bit simpler, at least at first glance, in order to get beautiful documentation. Now, the one thing to remember is it's a little more difficult to link between and within documentation. Um, recently, in the last year, Eric Rose has created a project called Sphinx.js, which will auto-document JavaScript doc strings and pull it into your Sphinx documentation. So looking at the themes, themes are really what gives you the visual structure within um, Sphinx. And the e simplest way is to use the default, which is Alabaster. It's a nice, clean, minimalist um, theme. You could also the next level up would be to use a built-in theme, and there are several, probably about five or six. Um, there are also third-party themes, and to use those, you would import the theme in the conf.py file and then set different parameters. There is a website called sphinxthemes.org that actually gives you a visual display of all the different themes, or a lot of the major themes, and it's worth checking out. Um, Say you need more customization. Well, you could customize the CSS or certain elements within the CSS. You can extend or create new Jinja 2 templates to use within your documentation. Say you want to have a specific footer or a specific header. Um, you can adjust those templates, and that will take care of that. If you need 
any more customization than that. You can create your own theme. And I throw a big caution with that because I really only recommend it if you have the time to maintain it. Otherwise, it's really more of a burden than a help. And you can really get most of what you need done with all the rest of the things. So let's look back at what we've done and what we've had as our practical plan for Sphinx and our documentation. Um, I think it's a plan that will help you succeed and be effective in the real world. So first off, use sensible defaults. So when in doubt, use what Sphinx gives you as the default. You probably won't go too far wrong doing that. Um, configure things within the conf.py. Most of the things that you can configure are sort of true and false or have only like one, two, three, four options. So that's a great place to kind of focus next. Um, go through the different foundational steps that I talked about. Um, if you only hit that bottom tier, you're doing great. If you can add structure and improve your workflow even better, extensions are sort of like the, um, the whipped cream on top of a sundae. Keep iterating your docs, your projects evolve, your docs should evolve with it, but most importantly, just do your best. Docs matter for your project success. You wanna get your installation right. You wanna automate your workflow. And once you've done a number of these steps, take some time, congratulate yourself, celebrate your docs, don't view it as a burden. View it as something like, hey, this is gonna make my project better and more people will use it and I'll be famous or no, what? But, but basically I'm telling you, do your best, write docs, even if you're, you don't think you're a great writer, write your docs. Thank you. <laughs>